Hey, welcome to this week's Mortgage Minute with Mitch. And happy St. Patrick's Day to you. So a lot to get to this week. Um, I'm going to do my best to cover some kind of difficult topics here. So busy week. We saw the, the second and third largest bank collapses in U.S. history this week. So that's been the headline. Uh, so I want to break that down a little bit for you, give you some insight. I don't have all the answers, but I'm going to do my best to, to give you some uh, information here. Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank were the two banks to fail. Uh, SVB was the second largest, followed by Signature Bank, the third largest. Now for perspective, these were massive. So Signature Bank was the, uh, again, third largest. Now their deposits and assets were about equivalent to the number four through number 10 banks combined. And not only that, Silicon Valley Bank was about double signature banks. So these are massive dollar amounts we're talking about. These are big banks with a lot of money. Now a third bank almost went under, that's Republic Bank, but some of the bigger banks swooped in to save them. Now, I heard a great analogy, and uh, to understand kind of what actually took place here, it would be like if there's a massive retailer, like the likes of, say, Costco, Walmart, Target, you know, they all swooped in to save a competitor with billions of dollars. That's basically what happened. So these other banks that you know, would probably prefer less competition came in, gave billions of dollars to help save one of their competitors. So even though Janet Yellen, the Secretary of the Treasury and former head of the Federal Reserve came out and said, hey, our banking system is resilient, nothing to worry about. The fact that these banks are saving one of their competitors like that, that to me is probably the biggest warning sign out of everything I've seen this past week. Now, to, to help you kind of follow along with these headlines and, and kind of understand some of what caused these banks to fail, I want to give you two kind of like terms or help familiarize yourself with two pieces of this puzzle here. So first thing, you have a fractional reserve banking system. Now, if you're not familiar with what that means, essentially, if you deposit $100 at a bank, that bank's only required to keep $10 on hand as a reserve. They can take the other $90 and invest it. So that's what a fractional reserve banking system is. We only require 10% of the total deposits to be kept on hand so that if customers come in and want their money, only 10% of that's available. They can take the other 90 and invest it however they want. So to understand the next topic, unrealized losses, that's a little bit more complex, but I wanna dive in here real quick. So if you took that $90 and invested it, well, last year, prior to the last year, rates were extremely low. Now, if you take that money and invest it in something long-term, so picture like a CD. Most of us are familiar with CDs, as opposed to a savings account, which you know is earning you some interest, but you can then withdraw from as needed. A CD is kind of locked up, so you might have a 12-month or 24-month or maybe a 10-year CD, where that money's locked in for that term. It's giving you a higher rate of return, but you can't touch it. So what happens is a lot of these banks put their money in longer term investments that have very low rate of returns. They're safe, the money's tied up for a while, but you're guaranteed a return as long as it stays there. Now an unrealized loss is if that bank were to take money out before its maturity, well they, they would take a hit, they're gonna, they're gonna take a penalty. There's a loss that they would get by taking that money out early. That's an unrealized loss. It's not actually a loss unless they pull that money out early. So what's happening now is uh, if, if there's a run on a bank and everybody wants to take their deposits and they, they come in for more than 10% of what's there, then you have to liquidate those longer term investments at a loss and then it becomes a realized loss. So essentially that's what happened. Very, very short and abbreviated explanation. And we're in a situation right now with an inverted yield curve, if you've ever heard that term. What that means is typically the longer you invest, the more likely you are to see a return on that money. When rates rise as quickly as they have, like the situation we're in right now, that curve gets inverted to where short term, you could make more money than the money you had tied up long term because rates right now are higher. You have a higher rate of potential return. So people that had money tied up in long term investments wanted to take that out and put it in something that could give them a quicker or higher return in the short term. That's not a good sign and that's not good for the economy. So when you hear of an inverted yield curve, it's Basically what that means, you can make more money in the short term than the long term, that's not a good sign. So I know I just threw a ton of stuff at you, but these are important topics to help you understand what's actually going on in our market. And um, we gotta be paying attention to this. So political affiliations aside, we need to come together and really make sure we get this right and fix our economy. So some of the other headlines this week, the Consumer Price Index came out pretty much in line with expectations. Nothing crazy there, but 
you know, the, there wasn't a huge movement just based on that alone. Um, that was followed by the producer price index. That actually came back a little more favorable. There was even a revision to prior months that came down. So what it looks like is the producers are paying less for all the goods and services, which eventually should trickle down to the consumer. So going forward, that should be a good sign for the consumer price index that inflation is going to slow down. Time will tell, but that's what it looks like. Now next week the Fed meets, so we'll know a lot more Wednesday when they come out and kind of brief us on what they discuss between Tuesday and Wednesday at their meeting. So got a lot on their plate, a lot to discuss. So uh, next week could be just as volatile as this week. And as you can see, I mean, rates were up and down literally like a yo-yo, just morning to afternoon, up and down, day to day. is a wild week. Uh, so that brings me to my last point here. Is it still a good time to buy a home? Is this a good year or a good market to do so? At the end of the day, it all depends on your situation, but I would advise you to make sure you're on solid ground financially, you have a good stable job, and at that point, if that's really what you want to do, I'm here to help you, walk you through, and make sure that you take on the right investment for your situation. And I'll leave you with this. Home values since 1941 have gone up 73 years. They've only gone down seven, and they did stay flat in one. So if you want a solid investment with a return over time, there's not really a better investment out there than real estate. So happy to discuss that with you. Let me know how I can help. Uh, we're less than two weeks away from opening day. Cavs are still sitting in fourth place and the Browns are making all kinds of moves in free agency. So time will tell if that'll pay off. But as always, thanks for watching. Have a great St. Patrick's Day and we'll see you next week.